sing to me, oh muse. The Odyssey, an original adaptation written and retold for you by John Buckeridge. Chapter 2 The Prince's Quest The scream was piercing but brief. The note from Telemachus trembled in Penelope's hands as she read it again and again. Slowly she sank into a chair as tears sprang to her eyes. Her breath seemed to be catching in her chest. There wasn't enough air in the room. The door burst open as the old maid Euryclia bundled into the room. "'What's the matter, my lady? Are you well? Is one of those suitors bothering you?' She had a rolling pin in her hand, and she looked like she meant to use it. Seeing Penelope, though, the rolling pin fell to the floor, and she took the note and read it. "'That fool boy!' she gasped, sneaking off in the dead of night. Penelope looked up, her tears still shining in her eyes. "'Better he did it at night,' she said and I didn't have to watch another man I love sail away. Euryclia pulled Penelope into an embrace. Oh, my lady, come here, you poor thing. She clucked her tongue and made those little noises older women have always known how to make when giving a hug that never fail to comfort. Euryclia was originally brought to Ithaca as a slave by Odysseus's father long before Odysseus was born. She had been with the family for what seemed like forever, and everyone had taken to calling her Nanny. She had always been the first port of call for hugs when slips and trips and falls had brought out bruises, and she was an expert. Listen, my lady, I raised young Telemachus and his father before him, and I can tell you the two of them are like peas in a pot. I see the same cleverness and cunning in Telemachus as I saw in Odysseus, so trust me when I say he'll be safe on this journey, and he'll come back to you soon. They both will. I hope you're right, Nanny said Penelope. But I'm losing hope. Perhaps Telemachus is right, and it will just be better to know, one way or the other. She let the tears flow a few moments longer, enjoying the warm swaddling of Euryclia's hug. Then she took a deep breath and let it go. She dried the tears from her cheeks, rolled her shoulders back, and recovered her composure. Nanny, would you fix my hair? she said. I can't let these suitors see a moment of weakness in me. Not one. So with Euryclia's help, Penelope armed herself for battle. Let's leave her now and join Telemachus on his voyage as he arrived at the port of Pylos and approached the palace of old King Nestor. Despite being a prince himself, he'd never actually been taught how to address royalty, and as he waited in the hallway he shifted from foot to foot and tried for the twelfth time to straighten his tunic, which was already straight. Suddenly the door in front of him opened and he was ushered in. Taking a deep breath, he bowed deeply. My Lord Nestor, my name is... As I live and breathe, interrupted a reedy voice. Odysseus? Uh, no, of course, it can't be. You must be young Telemachus, am I right? He spoke about you often. Telemachus raised his head and looked at the old king. He looked like something out of a story, with silver white hair and a snowy beard framing brilliant blue eyes. He was slim, but in a lithe, healthy way that suggested he was still fit and strong despite his years. While he was still musing on this, though, Telemachus realized he had not replied. More awkwardly, he realized his mouth was gaping open, and he shut it smartly. "'I'll take that enduring silence as a yes, shall I?' inquired the old man. "'You really are the spit of your father. You took me back twenty years there. Not quite his gift for wordplay, though, I see.' Never mind, we can't have everything, can we? After all, where would we keep it? There was a twinkle in his eye that reminded Telemachus of a kindly grandfather, and it thawed his tongue in his mouth. My Lord Nestor, I am indeed Telemachus. I come to you in search of news of my father and what happened to him after the war. We've waited these last ten years, but he's yet to return to us, and nor has any news of him. Meanwhile, our situation grows desperate at home. My mother is beset by suitors for her hand in marriage, all clamouring after her like a piece of meat. She does her best to hold them off, but they pressure her again and again to choose one of them, and they refuse to leave our home until she does. For almost four years they have feasted in our halls, eating and drinking through the wealth of Ithaca, and it's only a matter of time before they lose patience and take matters into their own hands. I fear for our future, I fear for our safety, I fear for our very lives. We need to know, Lord Nestor, if my father lives or if he's... 
He struggled for another word, desperately trying not to say what he was thinking. Taken up a new residence in Hades' realms. I ask you humbly for what wisdom and knowledge you can offer. He was convinced he'd stumbled through the whole speech, but Nesta raised an eyebrow and smiled. Not quite so bad with the speeches after all. Practice that one long, did you? His smile turned into a wry grin, and Telemachus couldn't help but smile too. The whole boat ride over, he confessed. And at that, Nestor let out a squawk of laughter and slapped the arm of his throne. Ha! Good form, good form. <laughs> Telemachus, you are most welcome here, noble son of my noble friend. His face changed from a wry grin to a crestfallen frown as his frosted brows drew down low. Alas, I cannot give you what you seek. Odysseus and I were quickly parted after leaving Troy, and I've heard no news since. However, I can suggest you travel to Sparta and seek news from Menelaus. He was long at sea after Troy and may have more news to offer. For now, though, let me do what I can and host you with the honour you deserve. And with that, a great feast was prepared, and Telemachus spent the night listening to the kindly old man telling him stories of his father in Troy. The next morning, Nestor provided chariots and a guide to take him to Sparta. Go safely, young Telemachus, and have confidence when you meet Menelaus. You're not half so bad at this as you think you are. You'll be fine. Smiling broadly, Telemachus set off for Sparta, but regardless of Nestor's words, he was still nervous when he got there. Um... Is my tunic straight? he asked an attendant while they were waiting to enter the throne room, but before he could answer, the door was opened. Despite his best efforts, Telemachus's mouth fell wide when he saw the throne room of Sparta. Gold, silver, and jewels were everywhere. He'd never seen so much wealth in one place. There were so many shiny surfaces, it was almost hard to keep your eyes open as the light bounced all over the place. It's a bit much, isn't it? said a deep, gravelly voice. I told Helen it's a bit much, but she insisted on it, you know, likes shiny things, you see, does Helen. Telemachus looked round to find the owner of the voice. Despite the sparkles, he was amazed he hadn't noticed him before. King Menelaus was a great bear of a man, tall as a statue and powerfully made, with thick, meaty arms. Come in, come in, let me take a look at you, said Menelaus. So you'll be Telemachus. Goodness me, but you look like your father. Indeed he does, said another voice, but there was nothing gravelly about this one. It was smooth like silk and flowed like honey. Queen Helen had entered the room. The resemblance is striking. What brings you to our court, young prince? Sir, this was the reason Odysseus had been called away to war twenty years ago, this was the reason he couldn't remember his father's face any more. If Telemachus had to pick just one word to describe her, it would be graceful. It wasn't just that she looked graceful or moved gracefully, it was more that when she addressed you, you felt like you'd been graced by the presence of something wonderful. It was said that she was the daughter of Zeus himself, and seeing her, Telemachus could well believe it. That she had inspired ten thousand men to go to war suddenly made perfect sense. In fact, it seemed like shortfall. And yet, despite all her beauty, Telemachus would much rather have had his father with him this last twenty years, and a small part of him hated her for taking that away. It was like there was a hole within him that could never be filled. Something was missing, and he was sure that his father would know what it was. And he could save us from the suitors too, he thought. Screwing up his eyes, he tried to hold back tears as he explained the whole sorry story. Gods above, cursed Menelaus, how dare those men treat you this way? Your mother must weep every day. Say the word, Telemachus, and we shall march on Ithaca with my army to reclaim your kingdom from these unworthy scoundrels. There will be time for talk of that later, intoned Helen, laying a hand on her husband's arm. You and I have both seen the fruits of war and it would not do to put Queen Penelope in danger. For now, we shall eat and take a moment of rest. And so Helen and Menelaus hosted Telemachus and told him stories of his father in his youth, and when the meal was done, Menelaus turned to Telemachus. You ask for news of your father. Well, I believe I may have some to share. 
Telemachus leaned forward as Menelaus began his story. When the war was over, we went our separate ways. Your father and his Ithacans went their way, and we went ours. It seems we both fared badly, though, for we were instantly whipped up in a storm. For years we tried to get home, but we were denied at every turn, until a nymph took pity on us, and told us that if we captured the old sea god Proteus and held him fast, he would tell us three truths. She showed us his lair, and for hours on end me and my men lay in wait for him. Gods, it stunk in that place, all full of seals and discarded fish bones, he shuddered at the memory. Eventually, the sea god arrived, though, and as soon as he sat down to rest, we pounced and grabbed hold of him. But he did not give up easily. Oh, he transformed himself into all manner of creatures, some we knew and some we had never yet seen. For a day and a night he fought us as we grasped hold of him, but eventually he yielded and offered us the promised truths. I first asked him how I might get home, and he told me. I next asked him what offerings to make to ensure safe passage, and he told me. Finally, I asked him whether any of my comrades had not made it home safely. He told me of the death of one of our number at sea. He told me of the death of my own brother when he returned home. And when I asked him who the third man was, he told me, It is Laertes' son, the Ithacan. He sits on the shores of Calypso's isle and weeps into the sea. Menelaus looked significantly at Telemachus, and Telemachus felt his heart leap into his throat at the news. He felt prickles of energy shoot all through his body, and a huge smile painted itself on his face. Now that was many months back, Menelaus went on, and I can't say if he's still there, but I can tell you for sure that he was alive then and itching to get home. Telemachus sat stunned and still. This was it. This was the news he'd been waiting for. His father was alive. But if he was stuck on an island, then how would he get back to them now? Helen seemed to read his mind, and her voice was like a soft breeze as she said, Fear not, Prince Telemachus. We know your father well. If ever there was a man who could overcome the odds, it was him. And so for the first time in a long time, Telemachus had hope in his heart. Meanwhile, Half a world away on Calypso's tiny island, Odysseus looked out across the sea, and for some reason he couldn't explain, in spite of all the tears he'd shed that day, he began to feel that the odds were about to turn in his favour.